we now come to the underdamped response. In the underdamped response, we have changed the value of the resistance to achieve an underdamped response. The rest of the circuit and initial conditions are exactly the same. We have increased the resistance so that we know that the response ultimately becomes equal to uh, an underdamped one, an underdamped one. So up till now we know that uh, we write the response in such a way. For example, for an overdamped circuit or overdamped case. For critically damped, we don't write it like this. Why? Because S1 and S2 are equal, so we introduce a T here. So here, what is going to happen, we know that S1 and S2 are computed like this. And the case of underdamped is when omega naught is greater than for underdamped case. alpha square is less than omega naught square. When this is the case, obviously uh, in this uh, radicand, radical sign, we have a negative term. So square root of a negative term is not possible and uh, we know what is going to happen. Let us, for example, consider this term to be written as minus omega naught square minus alpha square square root. And we can write this as since alpha square is a smaller value than omega zero square, so this would be a positive value, and this is sorry, this is the famous iota. In engineering, we represent iota by j. So what do we get here? Is something that we refer to as omega d. Omega d is termed as the natural resonant frequency. Omega zero is the, the resonant frequency and this is the natural res resonant frequency. Some other texts uh, represent it as the damping frequency hence the D, but somehow Hyatt has kept this D but calls it a natural resonant frequency and there is no D in here. So I hope Hyatt has some good reason to call this natural resonant frequency. So now S1 and S2 are minus alpha plus minus iota omega D. So basically they are complex conjugates. So one is minus alpha plus g omega d and the other is minus alpha minus g omega d. So now the response will become a1 e raised to the power minus alpha plus j omega d t plus a2 e raised to the power minus alpha minus j omega d t. Now we are going to deal with uh, complex numbers and uh, let us see if we can somehow uh, turn this expression into an expression that does not involve complex numbers. So you can see that we can write this as we can take this term e raised to the power minus alpha t common and we are going to get a1 e raised to the power j omega d t plus a2 e raised to the power minus j omega d t. I hope you uh, remember that we can write a cosine of theta as e raised to power j theta plus e raised to power minus j theta by 2. 
and sine of theta as e raised power j theta minus e raised power minus j theta over j two iota two. So using these two identities and uh, converting this to this form e raised to the power minus alpha t a1 plus a2 e raised to the power j omega d t plus e raised to power minus j omega d t by 2 so this whole term uh, okay let me write the complete term plus iota a1 minus a2 e raised power j omega dt minus e raised power minus j omega d t over iota 2 so this expression hands here this expression is equivalent to this expression you can uh, look at appendix 5 to understand how this uh, and this has converted to this but i hope you can review the appendix 5 and uh, understand that how we have written this expression from this one obviously you can you can expand this and solve this to see that this can ex be expanded and equal to this so both are equal and from these identities we know that we can if we call a1 plus a2 a1 is a constant a2 is a constant so and their sum is another constant let us uh, write them down as b1 e raised power minus alpha t and this whole thing is now equal to cos of omega d t plus so this iota is in, in, in included in this new constant so a1 minus a2 into iota is a new constant let us call it b2 and this whole thing is now equal to sine omega d t so the response in this form does not have any iota in here although b1 and b2 may be complex but usually for practical circuits they do not come out to be complex values they are mostly real values alpha is the real quantity because remember alpha was equal to in this case 1 over 2 rc and omega 0 or omega naught was equal to 1 over under root lc now add that omega d is equal to square root of omega naught square minus alpha square so omega d has the same uh, dimensions as omega naught and alpha so is a frequency as well so now this is the response so once we know that for uh, once a case is declared to be underdamped instead of writing that the response is of this type we are going to write the response to be of this type so once uh, this is clear we can obviously solve in the exactly same way as we have solved the uh, other cases in this particular case let me see the book and let me come up with uh, values so for this particular example the book have solved and calculated that alpha is equal to 2 per second omega naught is equal to under root 6 so omega naught has not changed and omega d is computed to be equal to under root 2 radian per second all these values are computed so now we know that v is equal to b1 e raised to the power minus 2 t cos of under root 2 t plus b2 sine of under root 2 t oh by the way i have missed this term multiplying this term here so we have an alpha, e raised to the power minus alpha t here as well e raised to the power minus 2 t 
key. This is a decaying exponent. This is a decaying exponent. This is a, uh, a sinusoidal term. It oscillates forever. This oscillates forever. But these are decaying exponents. When the two are going to mul get multiplied, obviously the cosine wave is going to die out with time. The sine wave is going to die out with time. And the sum is going to die, die out with time as well. And finding b1, b2 uh, is exactly on the same lines as we have done. So putting t is equal to zero, what do we get? V at zero, which in this case is zero. And if you put t zero here, cos of zero is one, and e s power zero is one, so we get b one. And sine of zero is zero, so this term becomes zero. So we get the value of b one. This term is zero here. And if we now take the derivative and put t equal to zero in here, we know that this will come out to be i zero plus over c, which is 10 over one over 42. That would be equal to, uh, now let us take the derivative of this thing. We have two terms here, so we will employ the formula for uv. And we know that if we take this as is and take the derivative of this, we are going to get a sine term. So you will write b1, take this as is, and when taking this as is, then we have to put t equal to zero in there as well. So this will become one, and the sine term here, sine zero is going to be zero. So whatever the constant uh, being multiplied, we are going to get a zero here. So that term is ignored at that zeros out. What will be the next term? We will take this term as is, with the t, uh, t equal to zero, so cos of zero would be one, and the derivative of this thing. So we are going to get b1, and this will be multiplied by minus two, and then derivative, of, um, if, because in taking derivative this comes here, and e raised per zero would be one. So we have taken the derivative and put t equal to zero simultaneously in this step. You can do this as well if you really understand what I am doing. Or otherwise, you can you should not save those one, two steps here, do them properly and then put t equal to zero. Similarly, for this term, so when I say b2, take this term as is and take derivative of this term, then the derivative will be cosine term. And cosine term zero is one. This term as is, t equal to zero, put here one. So we are going to get b2. And in taking the derivative, we are going to get a under root two here as well. Plus, there would be another term, but in that term we are going to get the sine to, uh, sine. The sine of zero is zero, so that would zero out. So here we got this thing, whole thing equal to 420. And now b1 is zero, so the, we, we can solve this and find that b2 would be equal to b2 would be equal to Two ten under root two, and therefore v would be equal to this term is zero because v one is zero. Two ten square root of two e raised power minus two t sine under root two t. And this will be the voltage expression for voltage and this is under damped case. Now you can see that if we plot this, there would be a sine term which will oscillate. A sine term will oscillate forever. And a decaying exponent will decay with time. So when the both are multiplied together, so a sine term will oscillate forever. However, a uh, sine term with this starting from this value is going to decay with time. So when we multiply both of them, we are going to get something like this. It's going to start from zero because when we put t is equal to zero, voltage must be zero, zero. And at t is equal to infinity, e raised to power minus infinity is zero. This is zero. So it's zero at the start 
0 at infinity and in between is going to start with the sign but because it will start decaying but the sign will start rising more quickly but uh, with time sign will uh, be rising less quickly and this will be decaying faster so we are going to get something like this it will go it will go up and then it it will it will come down and it will come down and where sign is zero it will pass through zero it will pass through zero and then it will oh, oh, it will overshoot the final value and it will keep decaying and will pass from zero again and it will keep doing this uh, for eternity but its amplitude will keep decaying so there will be a max value it will not it may not be where the sign has a max value it may be just it may be before that so there will be a tm where it will have a max value and then it will overshoot and then start decreasing so there will be a, a, a negative max here as well let us call this time as tm2 and this one as tm1 so the max value we have to find the max value so that we can determine what will be less than what will be one percent of it so that we can find the settling time obviously we can take the derivative and put equal to zero to find the time there will be several times and we know that its behavior is periodic so there will be but we are only concerned with those uh, times that basically uh, uh, would be relating to the peaks or the values that are uh, less than uh, equal to 1% of the max value and or less than that so here the book has actually solved it not very elaborately but it has given values so in the book uh, in after a description tells that the value of this this value vm1 and this value vm2 given vm1 as 71.8 volts it's larger than all the previous cases and the time is 0 0.435 second and vm2 is minus 0 0.845 it has uh, changed the polarity but we are going to ta take the absolute value so this is more than one percent so the settling time will be after this one when it decays to and this happens at a time of 2.66 seconds so when all the analysis the same analysis is done and using maybe the hit and trial method they have tried to solve it they have found that the settling time for this case is 2.92 seconds and this is smallest smaller than smaller than other cases now you can see that we have chosen r such that the the overshoot was of a larger value if we choose r a little smaller the over there would be an overshoot but it would be of a value much uh, a value lesser than this one so if the overshoot has a peak of value less than one percent of this value the max value then the settling time would be here somewhere here before it becomes zero before it, it crosses zero and we can we can get uh, uh, an even smaller settling time so you see choosing the right value of r can result in in a, in, in a lesser settling time and to sum sum it up in all the three cases the overdamped case the critically damped case and the underdamped case the smallest time can be obtained from the underdamped 